see you there. Welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Patrick Hess, the Planetarium Specialist at Union Station, and thanks for tuning in. We're doing things a bit differently today, in case you didn't notice. Got a bit of a change of scenery. Uh, maybe we've upgraded our green screen technology with three dimensions. Or maybe I took a fateful flight on Oceanic uh, number 815 and, uh, well, let's just say I may be lost, but that's okay. At any rate, we're going to keep this thing rolling. Now, this is a pre-recorded stream, so I'd encourage you to write into the comments section if you have any questions, and future Patrick will hopefully make his way off this island and answer those questions live. So while this is pre-recorded, future Patrick will be live in the comments section, so be sure to ask your questions or just say hi and give a shout out if you want. Today's topic will be about celestial navigation. Now, if you've watched any of our streams before, you're tuning in for the first time, don't forget, you can rewatch all of our past live streams on our YouTube channel. We've covered a lot of deep dive topics about uh, space and the solar system and stars and stellar evolution and all sorts of really exciting things. So check out the Arvind Gottlieb Planetarium on YouTube and you can find all of our past streams there. But like I said today, we're gonna be talking about using the stars to navigate, celestial navigation. And uh, we're also just going to be talking about navigation in general and how early peoples were able to find themselves or the, find their way around using a navigation both at daytime and nighttime. So there is a daytime star, of course, the sun, and we can use that to navigate too. But we're going to start by talking about land navigation. And the history of land navigation goes back to uh, really the Babylonian times. One of the oldest surviving maps was the Babylonian map of the world. Uh, and this uh, is a clay tablet about the size of a modern smartphone. Uh, and we think it dates back to about 700 to 500 BC. And it depicts a Babylon, uh, at, uh, a circular Babylon city at the center, just bisected by the Euphrates River and surrounded by oceans. And as you can see, it's pretty crude and really doesn't depict anything in a realistic fashion in terms of distances and layouts. Um, so, uh, historians really think it was more of a form of artistic expression. They're not really used for navigation. The first real attempt at mapping the world in any realistic sense was really in the second century AD. Uh, with the mathematician and astronomer Ptolemy. Ptolemy is often credited as inventing geography, although he did it for a reason you may not expect. Back then, science and superstition were kind of merged, and uh, Ptolemy was actually an astrologer, so he believed the positions of stars corresponded with your hometown birthplace, and they could predict your future. Uh, but at any rate, he was interested in mapping the world to correspond with the stars in that way, for astrology's sake, uh, to create better horoscopes. Uh, still, he created an incredibly accurate, for the time, map of the world with uh, about 10,000 known locations, all the way from Britain to Europe uh, and Asia and North Africa. Ptolemy also invented a way to depict the Earth, uh, a round Earth in a two-dimensional form, like modern-day flat maps. Yes, we did know the Earth was round, even all the way back then in the 2nd century AD. And from there, mapping of land only became more advanced and more accurate. But what about the oceans? Of course, when you're on the ocean, uh, there are much fewer landmarks. There's no uh, buildings or mountains to kind of navigate off of. So how do you find your way in both daytime and nighttime since it's important to be able to navigate during both of those times? Well, let's talk about ocean navigation and we're going to change our scenery a little bit here. So ocean navigation. Now, uh, the ocean is intrinsically tied to navigation. The word navigation comes from the Latin word navigare. Uh, which means to go by sea, and that itself comes from two different words, uh, two different Latin words, navis meaning ship, and agare meaning to go or to drive. And so navigation has always been intrinsically connected to the ocean. Ocean traveling peoples were actually able to navigate the seas millennia before the land explorers in Europe. Uh, one example are the, uh, is navigation with the Indo-Pacific region, and this began all the way back in 3000 BC with the Astronesians. Uh, they left Taiwan and spread into the islands of Southeast Asia, colonizing, colonizing Micronesia and the Philippines centuries before the Roman Empire even began. These early explorers used a number of tools. Uh, for example, they observed migration patterns of birds, as well as looking at waves and swells to help them detect nearby land uh, and those uh, sort of landmarks that they couldn't see with their eyes but see evidence of. Uh, they also had songs and mythological stories to help them remember different landmarks and different uh, things that they might see by uh, the ocean. And they also used star navigation. And of course it is the daytime right now, but I do have a little diagram that'll help us talk about how we can use the stars to navigate either by land or sea. So let's change things up again. Okay, so normally we do our stellar navigation during our star tours, which of course you can go to the planetarium if you'd like to watch one of our live star tours. We are open to the public right now. Um, and we've done uh, virtual star tours on our live streams, but of course with the sun out, I had to improvise a little bit. So we're gonna do our star tour on the sands of the beach. 
And I have two different circles here depicting the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere because if you're above or below the equator, you're going to have a different view of the stars and it's going to change how you navigate. If you go below the equator, for example, you cannot see the North Star. So let's start with the Northern Hemisphere, uh, a hemisphere that many of our viewers are probably familiar with. And I have a couple different constellation patterns here. I have the Little Dipper and Big Dipper over here, which are part of two official constellations, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. The Dippers are what we call asterisms, unofficial star patterns. And we have two official constellations next to it. We have Cassiopeia, this little zigzag W shape. And we have Cepheus, this sort of upside down house shaped pattern. So uh, for navigating in the Northern Hemisphere, we have uh, a pretty, pretty easy technique. Basically, you're gonna look for the Big Dipper, which is visible in uh, many Northern Hemisphere locations. Uh, and you're going to look for the scoop of the Dipper here. So right there. So there is the Dipper's scoop. Whoa, um, whoa we're figuring out how to do this backwards. There we go. And it's very simple. All you have to do is locate the two stars at the end of the Dipper here. Uh, and then, whoo, there we go, those two stars. And then you're gonna draw an imaginary line uh, through those stars up into the sky, right over to this star at the end of the little bear's tail, or the end of the little spoon. This star right here is Polaris, the North Star. Polaris will always uh, point directly north because if you looked at a map of the globe and you looked at the North Pole, shining light straight up into the sky would point right at Polaris. That's how it gets its name. So no matter where you are on Earth and no matter what time it is, if you can find that North Star, you can always find North because it always points North, and that's an easy way to find it. Now, if for some reason the Big Dipper is obstructed, if it's either below the horizon, uh, parts of it are, or if it's behind a cloud or perhaps behind some trees, you can also use Cepheus and Cassiopeia. Uh, Cassiopeia and Cepheus are on the opposite side of the North Star, uh, and basically if you take uh, Cassiopeia here, and this uh, drawing is not exactly to scale, but uh, essentially, the W part of Cassiopeia here is sort of open and facing roughly towards the North Star. So if you find that W shape, it's kind of pointing towards Polaris, and you can kind of triangulate with Cepheus here, uh, the top of the little house shape. So the North Star will be on uh, close between the Big Dipper and Cepheus and Cassiopeia. So that's the Northern Hemisphere. But like I said, if you travel below the equator, you cannot see the North Star, which makes sense if you imagine standing on a globe uh, the, uh, you would have to look through the Earth to be able to see the North Star from that vantage point. So the stars of the Southern Hemisphere are going to be a bit uh, harder, or a, bit, uh, a bit unfamiliar to uh, some of our viewers. But the main thing uh, to know is that there is no South Star. So there is no star that is perfectly south, not a bright one at least, and so explorers in the Southern Hemisphere, before we had compasses and GPS, had to use a different technique to find South, and they used a triangulation method using two constellations. The first is the Southern Cross, or Crux. This very, very bright cross pattern is really easy to spot in the Southern Hemisphere. And then we also have uh, the constellation uh, Centaurus, which is kind of circling around it. Now, the most important thing to know about Centaurus is the two brightest stars in Centaurus are right here next to Crux, and they're gonna stand out quite a bit. So these two stars. We nickname these two stars the Pointer Stars. And basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna do a little bit of triangulation. And I'm gonna attempt to draw on the sand here. Essentially, you're gonna first draw a line through the Southern Cross, kind of like this. And you're gonna imagine that line drawn through uh, the sky. And then you're gonna draw a line perpendicular to these pointer stars. And I'm gonna draw it, it might not be in frame here, but I'll show it there. So we can see we've just triangulated between the two star, the two pointer stars and the, north, the southern cross, rather, and we draw a, a line basically bisecting where the south pole is. So I've got a little seashell there. That's roughly where the south pole is. Another technique you can use if you can't find the southern cross is you can use the Magellanic Clouds. So these two piles of seaweed are actually part of our diagram. They represent uh, the two uh, galaxies that are orbiting the Milky Way. So there are actually two galaxies orbiting the Milky Way. They're small dwarf galaxies and they are called the Small and Large Magellanic Clouds because they were first absorbed, observed by Magellan when he circumnavigated the world. Uh, and these uh, will help us triangulate uh, as well. Basically, the Small Magellanic Cloud, which is the smaller, uh, densely packed group of stars here, is just opposite of the uh, Southern Cross. So if I kept that line going, it would point roughly over to the Small Magellanic Cloud. So you could also use the Magellanic Cloud there to help triangulate south. And that is how we can navigate at nighttime uh, using the stars. And that works on land and sea, of course. Uh, 
So in the Mediterranean, the Minoans of Crete built architecture that aligned with the rising sun and equinoxes so that sailors at sea could look to the coastlines and see alignments of those buildings to help them figure out where they were. Um, but of course, they had to be close to the coasts for that. In Homer's Odyssey and many other ancient writings, there are references to naval vessels using the stars and constellations for navigation. Constellations that we've seen, like Ursa Major, as well as some asterisms like the Pleiades Cluster. Constellations like Luotes, Orion, were common for navigation as well. Now moving forwards in time, as with many areas of science, the Arab Empire actually contributed significantly to the development of navigation techniques uh, during the Middle Ages. Uh, during those dark times, uh, Europe was actually pretty scientifically stagnant, um, but a lot of uh, Islamic nations actually developed a lot of advances in science during those times. So during those dark periods, uh, sort of in the early second millennia, we still see a lot of scientific advancements coming from uh, Arab empires. Um, now, apart from the Nile, the Tigris, and the Euphrates, navigable rivers in the Islamic regions were actually pretty uncommon, so transport by sea was very important. Islamic geography and navigational science actually used magnetic compasses, so they developed magnetic compasses back then, uh, as well as a tool called the Kamal, uh, which we'll see in just a second. Now, compasses, uh, like I said, have been around for almost a thousand years, uh, and they can help with directional navigation, uh, but they won't tell you your position. So if you know where you are, they can be helpful for getting, for getting to the next spot. Uh, in fact, there's a technique called dead reckoning, reckoning, excuse me, dead reckoning, um, which uses previously de determined positions combined with the direction of travel with a compass uh, that will lead uh, to sort of help you get where you're going, but there's cumulative error. So if you're in slightly the wrong spot and you use your compass to get the next spot, you'll be even more of the wrong spot and moving on from there, you'll be even further off. So we need to learn our position. So knowing our position is incredibly important. Now, how do we define our position? Uh, well, we define our position on land using latitude and longitude. Now, let's talk a little bit about latitude and longitude using our little visual aid here, which hopefully is in frame. <laughs> so, uh, latitude and longitude divide the Earth up into uh, sections that we can use for navigation. Uh, we'll imagine that up here is the North Pole, and uh, we'll start, uh, we want to start actually with, uh, let's see, latitude. Let's start with latitude. Now, the way I remember the difference between longitude and latitude is latitude is like a ladder that you would climb up the side of the Earth. So latitude is going to divide the Earth um, on its side. So. We draw latitude lines they're going to separate the earth like this so i can continue drawing more and more and latitude lines will not all be the same length the farther north or south you go from the equator they'll be shorter but dividing the earth like this into sort of layers of a cake defines latitude and this will define how far north and south you are and we do the same thing on the southern hemisphere Drawing our lines of latitude again. And I should do this a little bit faster. <laughs> of course, this uh, is not exactly the scale. We are using a beach ball here. We're improvising. I was looking for a uh, volleyball, but uh, the only volleyball I could find was taken by Tom Hanks. All right, so we have our lines of latitude. Remember, like a ladder climbing up the side of the earth. And so how do we figure out our latitude? There are some different techniques. And one early technique was using a device called the Kamal. So I have a Kamal constructed here from uh, some rudimentary materials. As you can see, it's got uh, basically a small rectangular shape. Uh, I made it out of cardboard, but it was often made out of wood. And then some string or twine uh, stretched out with some knots in it. So these knots are dividing the rope in sections here, evenly spaced. And this is called a kamal. This is one of the first tools, uh, first instruments used uh, to help determine uh, latitude, that first part of knowing our position on the earth. So uh, the way this works, and we're gonna try to do this on camera, we'll see what happens. We're gonna place one end of the string in your teeth, and they're gonna hold the other end away from the body, roughly parallel to the ground. So I'm gonna do it like this, and you're gonna hold it out like this. Oh, so holding it out kind of like this, there we go, I think we, this way you can see it a little better. Holding it from your teeth out parallel with the ground. So when you're holding it out like that, you're basically gonna move the card along the string until the bottom is parallel with the ground 
and the top is aligned with uh, a, a location you know in the sky. So often it'll be the pole star at nighttime, so Polaris in this case. Um, although I should mention that Polaris is not always the North Star and it has not always been the North Star due to something called precession. If you want to, more, want to learn more about precession though and what other stars have been the North Star in the past, I definitely encourage you to come check out our star tour at the Planetarium because we dive in depth in there. But for now we're going to assume that Polaris is the pole star. So you're basically going to align the bottom of the card with the horizon and the top of the card with the North Star. And to do that you're going to have to move the card towards you. So you would bring it closer to you if the North Star was above the card and you would keep doing that until it was close at a certain point and again the bottom of the card was aligned with the ground and the top of the card was aligned with the North Star. And then what you do is you look at the lines or the, sorry the, the knots and these knots were at predefined positions that you'd basically be able to use to calculate uh, your uh, latitude based on the angle between the ground and the North Star. Um, and so again, these knots would be in predefined locations that somebody who had a Kamal would know that, well, if I'm at the second knot, that means I'm at 20 degrees north. And if I was at the third knot, maybe I'd be at 10 degrees or something like that. So that's the Kamal, very rudimentary tool, but it worked. Uh, moving forwards in time, uh, or well, the Kamal was uh, used for quite a while, for centuries in fact, uh, and it was refined over centuries and used by other explorers in other regions, including Europe. Um, a similar tool was called the Cross Staff or Jacob Staff. Uh, and this was used well into the Renaissance period. But around the Renaissance period, a new device was invented called a sextant. And I have a device, uh, uh, I have a sextant here. Now, I do want to preface, this sextant is a slightly diff a different variation of a sextant used to determine distances, but the construction is similar, so any, any hardcore sextant fans in the audience may be complaining this isn't a real sextant, but it is constructed the same way as a sextant is. I mean, basically, this is just sort of an advanced Kamal. And what you'll do is you'll look through uh, an eyepiece on one end, and then on the other end are, is sort of a split view. And this split view will have an opening on one side and a mirror on the other side. And what you'll do is you'll align the, one of the views with the horizon, or the, the ocean line, because if you're on the ocean, this would often be the horizon. And then you'll adjust it up and down, and what'll happen is with the mirror, one side will stay on the horizon, and the other side will uh, show, uh, will move vertically. And what you'll do is you'll align it until the sun is lined up with the horizon. I'm gonna draw this out to kind of help uh, you understand this a little bit more. Um, so basically, while you're looking through the sextant, uh, you will have sort of a square view like this. And on one end, you'll align it with the horizon. So in this case, it'll be the ocean there. And at first, the ocean will be lined up as well. But as you move the sextant up uh, with the mirror in place, one side will continue facing the ocean, but the other side will move up and down. And as you move it up and down, you'll try to find the sun, and there will be filters on here so you don't blind yourself, of course. But basically, you move it up and down until you line it up with the sun. So the sun is now aligned with the ocean line here. And when you do that, uh, you basically have position the sextant in a way uh, that you know that the angle calculated between the sun and the horizon uh, is uh, going to be on the sextant and then you open it up or you take it off your eye and then you'll see on the bottom of the sextant uh, are angles measured out and this will tell you the angle between the sun and uh, the horizon. Now there's an important step that you do have to take if this is going to work. To use the sextant properly you need to know when the sun is at its highest position, when it's at noon. As the sun moves across the horizon, it moves in an arc pattern. And uh, if the sun is not at its highest point, the sextant is gonna give you a measurement that's wrong. Um, and there are uh, a couple different ways to uh, figure out when the sun is at its highest point. The easiest way is to just look at the sun's shadow. Uh, so basically, when the sun's shadow is at its shortest point, then you know it's uh, at, the sun is at its highest point. I can draw this out too, and a common way of doing this uh, would be to use there we go, to use a sundial. Uh, and you can have a sundial on a ship uh, that is uh, leveled out uh, in the same way that compasses can be leveled out, uh, just using gravity and counterweights. Uh, so uh, if you had a sundial on a ship, you'd be able to figure out um, where the sun is at its highest point. Uh, so, uh, so let's draw our sundial here. So we have the sun shining against uh, a, a post, basically, on our sundial and that is going to cast a shadow. And again, the sun is going to be moving uh, in an arc here. And basically, as the sun moves in its arc, 
the shadow's length will change. So when the sun is over here, the shadow is going to be pretty long. But as it moves higher in the sky, the shadow gets shorter. And when the sun is directly behind that sundial, the shadow is at its shortest point. And when it moves on, it'll be a little bit longer and then even longer. So using that sundial, we can figure out when the sun is at noon, roughly, and that'll help us to determine our latitude. So again, climbing up the ladder. Now again, latitude only tells us how far north and south we are. Um, and with the calculation of latitude being solved, there was one other piece of the puzzle, and that is longitude. And so longitude, let's go back to our beach ball here. Longitude is going to be uh, in the other direction. So again, latitude is like a ladder climbing up uh, the, the globe here. But longitude is going to be uh, very helpfully defined already, actually, uh, by our beach ball. It is going to be just along these seams here. So longitude measurements are all the same length. They basically cut the earth in half and they uh, rotate by degrees. So we can draw another longitude line here, uh, right through the text on my beach ball, that's great. Um, so another longitude line here, and another line here, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and again, these are all the same length, so you can maybe kind of use that to remember longitude, they're all the same length. Latitude is like climbing a ladder. But now we have gridded out our Earth. And if we know how far north and south we are, our latitude, and how far east and west we are, our longitude, then we'll know exactly where we are. But again, latitude, or sorry, longitude, was uh, figured out a little bit later. So um, actually, this was such a, a difficult problem that uh, the, uh, the Queen, uh, Queen Anne of Great Britain at that time, uh, in 1714 established uh, something called the Longitude Act. And the Longitude Act of Great Britain was basically a competition. Queen Anne said that, all right, we know our latitude, but longitude's a really tough problem. If we could figure out our longitude, it would make traveling the oceans way easier, and for, in her case, uh, what she cared about is it would make trade way easier. So Great Britain could make a lot more money, essentially. So she uh, established this prize. She basically said any explorer who could figure out uh, how to calculate uh, longitude would win a lot of money, essentially. So a lot of explorers started searching for a solution. There were a couple different directions taken by different people to attempt to solve this problem. Uh, but really the best and only way to fully and accurately calculate your longitude was to create a clock that worked on the ocean, to work on a boat. Now at that time, clocks existed. They were made with pendulums. But a pendulum clock does not work in the oceans because they're not level and they're constantly shifting and bobbing up and down. So a lot of scientists, including some famous ones like Isaac Newton and Christian Huygens, who uh, discovered uh, the moon of Saturn, I've mentioned him before, uh, they actually doubted that a clock like this could even be built. So these scientists who figured out some fundamental truths about our universe and about gravity didn't think that they could even build a clock that worked at sea. But of course, we did solve that problem eventually. Uh, in 1730, an English carpenter and clockmaker named John Harrison designed the first ever maritime clock, a clock that worked on the oceans. Now, it, uh, he designed it in 1730, but it took him five whole years to actually build one that worked, so to build the first working model. Uh, and when he did build it, uh, they took it on its first maiden voyage in 1736. So John Harrison sailed from Lisbon, uh, or to Lisbon, uh, on the HMS Centurion, and during this trip, his clock provided a decently accurate uh, timekeeping that actually helped place uh, the ship within 60 miles of its destination, which all things considered is pretty good. Uh, and uh, for his effort, he won 500 pounds at that time from the royal government. Uh, and I did some calculations. That's roughly equivalent to about $150,000 in today's money. So that's quite a prize for figuring out this uh, conundrum uh, when it comes to exploration. So once we had clocks that could work on the ocean, we could figure out our longitude, how far east and west we are. Now, let's talk about how to actually calculate that. It's pretty simple. Uh, first, you need a clock that's synchronized to a known location. And in many cases, especially with uh, English explorers, this was Greenwich, London. And uh, that's actually where the idea of Greenwich Mean Time comes from, because that is sort of the zero clock time that all the other time zones move off of. So whenever you see a plus five or a minus six time zone, that's all based off Greenwich, uh, which is a town near London. So in Greenwich, at noon, at 12 o'clock, if you synchronize your clock there, the sun will be at its highest point, okay? 12 o'clock noon, the sun is at its highest point in Greenwich. Uh, and to determine your longitude, you'll basically, um, when you start traveling, you'll record the time that you observe the sun at its highest point. So using our sundial like we did earlier, you'll be at the ocean, you'll be traveling to the west, say, on the open seas, and you figure out, okay, 
the sun is at its highest point now. Uh, and now we're going to look at our clock that, thanks to John Harrison, works on the oceans. So when I look at my clock and I'm on the ocean, let's say that our clock says it's 3 p.m. But where I'm at, I know that the sun is at noon. So the sun is at its highest point. So we are basically, um, so, uh, so again, we are at 3 p.m., uh, our local time, uh, but in Greenwich Mean Time, we're at noon. So basically, longitude divides the Earth up into 24 equal parts. And the, the, our diagram is going to be a little off here, uh, although this has six sections and we've divided them in half, so 12. So imagine another uh, dividing line here. So basically, we can divide the Earth into 24 equal slices, um, 24 hours of a day. And essentially what you'll do uh, is, uh, it's very simple. Each of these divisions, uh, these 1 24ths of the Earth, is about, or is exactly 15 degrees of longitude. So essentially what you'll do is you'll calculate the time that you're at right now. So in this case, as I said, we're on the boat. We know it's 3 p.m. our time. So we know that we are three hours to the west of Greenwich. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna take the known uh, longitude of Greenwich and we're gonna add 15 times three. So three hours, three divisions of the Earth in 24 sections, and that's gonna be 45 degrees. So we're gonna take Greenwich's longitude, add 45 degrees to it, um, and then that is gonna be how far to the west we are. So again, just using a clock and solar noon, we can determine our longitude. And then using the sun's angle to the horizon, we can determine our latitude. And those two factors helped us to figure out where we are on the oceans uh, and uh, from there, exploration just really skyrocketed in the 1700s and of course, as we know today, uh, we have people around the world and thanks to exploration, of course, as well, uh, we are here uh, in North America, uh, presuming that's where I am right now. Who really knows? So we're just about uh, ready to wrap up. Remember, if you are watching live, uh, uh, Future Patrick will be in the comments section answering any questions you might have. So if you have any last minute questions, be sure to put those in the comments because I can answer them. Uh, virtually in the comments section um, and we are just about to wrap up but the last thing I wanted to talk about just really briefly is how we determine our location today and that's mostly using GPS or the Global Positioning System and now the GPS started in 1973 uh, by the United States Department of Defense so it was a government program uh, and basically it consists of around 24 satellites that are orbiting the earth uh, and they were fully operational by 1993 now, originally, this was limited to use by the U.S. military, um, but in the 1980s, civilian use was uh, started to be allowed. And of course, today, everybody has a GPS on them uh, on their cell phone. Uh, and uh, that your cell phone, pretty much wherever you are on Earth, can determine basically where you are. Uh, and the way modern devices work is they just connect to uh, up to four, or a minimum of four satellites. And essentially, those satellites have uh, clocks on them. And so the satellites know their exact location and time. And by measuring the distance that you are from each of those four satellites, you can triangulate your location. Essentially, that's basically how it works. Uh, and that's simplifying it quite a bit, of course. Um, but using up, uh, a minimum of four satellites, uh, determining those four distances to your location, we can ba they can basically determine, based on where they are, roughly where you are. And actually today, modern satellites, uh, modern GPS systems can uh, are accurate down to uh, less than a foot. Uh, so you can have pretty accurate uh, global positioning using those satellites, and that uh, system is used around the world, and that's how we navigate today. Uh, so thanks to GPS, we don't have to use the stars quite a as much, but it is pretty cool knowing that dating back hundreds, if not thousands of years, humans and early explorers uh, were able to find their way at nighttime uh, and at daytime, no matter where they are on Earth. Now, I did mention our sextant here. Of course, this is a very fancy uh, tool that uh, you can buy, but they are a bit expensive. Uh, but you can make a sextant at home, which I did, uh, and I almost forgot to show it off, but I'm glad I just remembered. All you need is a protractor, so an angle measurement here, and a weight with the string. Uh, and basically, what you're going to do is you are going to you are going to pull the protractor out, and you might not be able to see the weight here, but basically. Um, you'll look down the line of the protractor, and you can attach a straw here if you want to line it up, but basically you'll move the protractor at an angle until it's lined up with the sun. Of course, you don't want to look like directly at the sun. Maybe it's better to do this at nighttime. You line it up with, say, the North Star, Polaris, uh, since you know that'll always be in the same place. And so if you line it up with North Star, Polaris, you can measure the angle, and this will be the angle from the horizon uh, up to the North Star. Uh, in this case, though, with a protractor, you'll have to uh, you'll have to reverse the measurement since this is starting from 90 degrees. So you take 90 minus that angle, and that'll tell you the angle from the horizon up to the North Star, and that'll tell you uh, how far north you are, your latitude. So you can make your own sextant at home using a protractor, some string, and a weight, 
Uh, so a fun activity you can try at home uh, if you'd like. And that does it for our stream today, folks. Hope you enjoyed our stream on Celestial Navigation today. Don't forget, we're streaming live on Monday night, so we'll be back here next week. Uh, we'll be uh, probably, hopefully, back home if I can find my way off this island. And next week's stream will be a Thanksgiving stream. We'll be taking a deep dive into what we can be thankful to space for, and to NASA, and to other space organizations. You know, we spend a lot of money and effort to go into space. Why do we do that? Well, it turns out there are a lot of reasons why we go to space, and there are a lot of uh, things that uh, space exploration and discoveries made in space can help us back here on Earth. So uh, tune in Monday night at 6 p.m. for that stream. Uh, for now, though, this will conclude our stream. If you have questions, uh, keep putting them in the comments. I'll stick around and answer them. For now, though, I have been Patrick Hess, your Planetarium Specialist, signing off. Hope you enjoyed it, folks, and I hope you have a fantastic week. I'm going to see if I can find my way off this island. <laughs>